Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Boys and girls, 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 girls. Welcome to Fenway Park. Fenway Park. Home of the Boston Red Sox. Red Sox. The first game my dad ever took me to was July 1st, 1920. And uh, Walter Johnson, the big train, pitched his only no-hit, no-run game. The first day that I ever came to a baseball game. I started to get holes out here that I never had before. Summer come, lighter bat, boom, pulling the ball. And heck's sake, it was easy. In fact, with a little luck, I might hit 400 without any sweat that year. I hit the ball good. I don't think we realized that we had won the pen until we actually were in the World Series with the Cardinals. You know, it was like some dream, 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 dream. Once you go between the lines, you know, you're wanting to prove to everybody that uh, you're the best at your position and what you do. And throughout life in my family, I've been taught that winning's uh, the only way and losing's not accepted. You just have to come back and do the best we can. But I, I like when people say we can't do something because it gives us a chance to prove them all. Red Sox fans are ongoing, enduring, continuing, and they last generation after generation, 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 generation. Forever Fenway, 75 years of Red Sox baseball. Here in what John Updike called a lyric little bandbox of a ballpark, play the eternal rhythms of youth. This is Fenway Park, where every nook and cranny tells a story of pennants won and lost, of great comebacks, of 1967's impossible dream. Indeed, here lives a procession of treasured moments that stretch back 75 years. Turn of Century Boston, a city of 500,000, where the past and the future mingle through time on its bustling streets. While the modern age swept through the city, the Boston Americans were sweeping baseball fans off to the Huntington Avenue grounds. The one-time carnival site was home to Boston's American League team, which was officially named the Red Sox in 1907. But soon after moving in, the team's popularity outgrew its modest ballpark. So in 1911, team owner John I. Taylor ordered the construction of a new park between Lansdowne and Jersey Streets in the heart of the Fen. A year later, the new home was unveiled, and on April 20th, 1912, Fenway Park was officially christened when the Red Sox beat the Yankees. At that time, Tris Speaker starred in what is still considered one of the game's golden outfields. He was flanked by Harry Hooper in right and Duffy Lewis in left. Lewis had the unique task of negotiating a 10-foot embankment in left field, which he played so convincingly it became known as Duffy's Cliff. Then there was Smokey Joe Wood, who reached his peak in 1912 when he went 34 and 5. But no game brought more notice than the dream matchup with Walter Johnson. After Johnson's claim that no man alive can throw harder than Joe Wood, Sox fans flooded Fedway to settle for themselves the hottest issue of the day. Johnson had already won 16 ball games straight, and Dad had won 13, I believe, straight. And it was the thought that, well, perhaps those two should go against each other. So they advertised it in in the papers like you'd advertise a fight, you know, the triceps and uh, this and that. And around the first base side and down the third base side, the people were jammed right up almost to the baseline. Fans in the outfield held back by ropes from getting onto the field. And it was one to nothing ball game, and it was decided by two doubles, one by Speaker and one by Lewis. And either the one by Speaker or the one by Lewis went into the crowd and normally wouldn't have been a double, but it went into the crowd, so it was a double. And that scored the run. And that's the way it turned out. Wood ended up tying Johnson's record with 16 straight wins and continued to amaze in the World Series when the Red Sox took on the powerful New York Giants and their best, Christy Mathewson. Mayor Honey Fitz raised the curtain on Fenway Park's first World Series, and the Red Sox capped off their first season at Fenway by becoming world champions, thanks in part to Fred Snodgrass and his fatal error in the final game. 
The series was marred by an incident involving Nuff Said McGreevy and his famed Royal Rooters. It seems the Red Sox sold the Rooter seats to out-of-towners for one of the games at Fenway, and a protest resulted in a near riot with mounted police. Undaunted, the Red Sox went on to win their first World Series in their new home. The city of Boston held a magnificent parade, and everyone turned out to hail Smokey Joe Wood, whose three series wins helped make Boston the world champs of 1912. No one knew it then, but the glory days at Fenway had only just begun. Oh, I love Fenway Park. Oh, I love Fenway. There's nothing like it. It's intimate, it's homey, it's chummy. You feel as though you're in your own living room. You know, the Red Sox become part of your life, part of your family. In 1914, Babe Ruth arrived in Boston, courtesy of the minor league Baltimore Orioles and $2,900. A bargain to Sox manager Bill Kerrigan, who said his new pitcher looked as if he might be handy with a bat. For now, Ruth was confined mostly to the mound, where he led an illustrious staff with 78 wins over four years. The Babe also captivated fans with his bat, for he wasn't just the game's best left-handed pitcher, but already the best player. With him, the Sox won three World Series in four years, and by 1918 had become a dynasty. As the decade drew to a close, a police strike shook the city of Boston. The news arrived that World War I was over, and the Red Sox suffered catastrophe. The Red Sox in 1918 had a world's championship and had three championships out of four years. But suddenly, of course, the fortunes of the Red Sox fell apart because we had an owner by the name of Harry Frazee. He produced plays on Broadway, and he had his troubles keeping the productions afloat. And the story goes that old Jake Rupert would send scouts to see the plays and to know the plays were failing. And knowing Frazee's desire, he would offer him a bundle of cash for some of the great ball players that he had on the club. And of course, uh, Frazee couldn't, uh, couldn't refuse him, and that's how we lost our great stars. And uh, it took us another 10 years before the Red Sox started to build. Indeed, if the 20s brought a wave of prosperity to Americans, they brought disaster to the Red Sox, who finished last eight times in nine years in the worst decade in American League history. The blame, of course, went to Harry Frazee, who decimated Boston's lineup by selling 15 players to the Yankees in five years. Of course, no transaction proved more treacherous than that of Babe Ruth. Sold for $125,000 and a $350,000 mortgage on Fenway Park, the Babe became a New York Yankee and soon the most colossal figure in the game. While the deal brought New York a dynasty, it brought the Red Sox to ruin, finally casting this dark episode into the baseball annals as the rape of the Red Sox. If troubles on the field weren't bad enough, a fire broke out at Fenway in 1926, and with little interest in the team, the damage lay untouched for seven years. I told him we should have a, an apartment here, because we spent so much time here. We would take a blanket and spread it out in the outfield. Had a radio and a snack, and listen to the game in the sun be looking for four-leaf clovers to, <laughs> to try to win the game. 1933, with America's plunged into the Depression, the plaintive cry became, brother, can you spare a dime? Not many could, of course, but in Boston, a 30-year-old millionaire named Tom Yockey could and did. He bought the Red Sox, and after announcing, I don't intend to mess with a loser, spent lavishly to improve the team. He also turned his attention to renovating Fenway Park, which suffered a fire during the million dollar reconstruction. Chief among the changes was the leveling of Duffy's Cliff, which made way for one of baseball's most famous ballpark features. By 1934, the left field wall was complete. Fenway Park was rebuilt, and the team had its best finish in 16 years. But Yaki wasn't through, more talent was on the way. Well, Mill, it looks like goodbye, Washington, and hello, Boston. And here's hoping we bring the pennant to Boston, their first since 1918. Well, Joe, if you bring home that old bacon, I'll cook it for you. Atta, girl. 
No shortstop in the league hit the ball harder than Joe Cronin. Eight times he drove in 100 runs. And once performing in Fenway, he boasted even more clout. But as a manager, Cronin had less success at first, a fact that prompted the arrival of still more stars. Jimmy Fox came in 1936. He was already the game's most feared right-handed slugger, and the stories of his power became legend. Bobby Doerr arrived in 1937 from San Diego. The future Hall of Fame second baseman helped give the Sox a smashing infield that featured a trio of 300 hitters and led the team to its best finish in two decades. As it turned out, the Red Sox discovered another kid in San Diego, and he was on his way. Just playing there was so much fun. We got along very, very nicely. Fenway Park's walls and me. We got along beautifully. Ted Williams arrived in 1939. His ambition, he announced, was to become the greatest hitter who ever lived. Now, such conceit may have been startling, but once the kid began to hit, no one seemed to argue. As a rookie, Williams hit 327 and led the league with 145 RBIs. The next year, he hit 344. But then in 1941, Williams shook the baseball world. In the All-Star game that year, he brought down the house of Briggs Stadium with a two-out bottom of the ninth home run that brought the Americans to victory. Williams was remarkable that season and went into the last day with a 400 batting average. Refusing to sit out the doubleheader against the Athletics, he went six for eight and finished at a phenomenal 406. Behind Williams, the Sox had a thriving offense in the 40s. Dom DiMaggio was a solid line drive hitter and a fitting compliment to shortstop Johnny Pesky. Together they formed a deadly duo at the top of the order, just the table setters that Williams needed. Dominic DiMaggio was the perfect player. Never made a mistake, never missed a sign. John Pesky and I would have a hit and run. I think he was the greatest hit and run batter that ever put on a uniform. He let off, I hit second because Williams hit third. And I used to uh, hit and run with him a lot. A lot of times I always got good pitches to hit because Williams was coming up next. But I would send Dom, I'd give him a sign, and he'd take off, and we had it for a number of years. And I often said that uh, Williams uh, sent Dominic and I to an early retirement. Before his retirement in 1941, Lefty Grove entered his name into the baseball annals. In scorching 90-degree heat at Fenway Park, Grove became the fifth pitcher in the 20th century to win 300 games. No one knew it then, but the sweet glow of summer was about to turn dark. It's uh, probably not even something you can write about or even describe. You gotta go to Fenway Park, and then you feel it, then you sense it, then you smell it. There's a chemistry uh, here. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. World War II cast misfortune upon the Sox as it raided their lineup and shortened thriving careers. Most of us were probably in, in our prime at the time. Ted Williams, Bobby Doerr, and myself. I believe I lost three of the best years of my baseball career in the service. Ted Williams would lose three precious years to the service. In 1942, he won the first of his two triple crowns and then went off to war. The loss of key players hit the Red Sox hard, and the team that showed so much promise tumbled in the standings. But by 1946, recovery came. The war had finally ended, and while America was getting back to business as usual, its baseball teams were reunited. At Fenway Park, the Red Sox were back in full complement. Everything came together, and Boston's offense was as potent as ever. And for once, the Sox had plenty of pitching. Boo Ferris won 25 games, and along with his outstanding sidekick, Tex Houston, set the Sox at a furious pace. In late April, they dashed off the longest winning streak in club history, 15 straight. At the All-Star break, the Red Sox were unstoppable and had first place by four games. Ted Williams swung the bat as never before and again grabbed the spotlight on the All-Star game, fittingly played at Fenway Park. 
Williams had already singled twice and homered when he came up in the eighth inning to face Rip Sewell and his baffling Ephus pitch. Rip Sewell, an outstanding pitcher, uh, had great success this year with that pitch. And uh, it was a pitch that he'd step and then he'd throw high. It had tremendous trajectory. I've never seen a pitch like it. The most phenomenal part of it was he got it over the plate. He could drift it down and get a strike with it. And nobody hit a home run on it. And, and he came into the All-Star game, and we, American Leaguers, were all talking about it. And we pretty much agreed nobody could, uh, could hit one out. Dickey looked at me, though, and he said, you can hit one out. And he threw that pitch to me, and the first one was just a ball, and I really got that thing timed good because it was floating up there at me. And then he threw another one, and I flung from my heels and happened to hit it just right. And wasn't blowing out that day, and it made the bullpen. Williams sparked the Americans to an easy win. His batting exploits led to an MVP and a pennant for the Red Sox. The next goal was, of course, a world championship. And for that, Boston would have to beat the Cardinals, winners of their fourth pennant in five years. Though Ted Williams and Stan Musial were the big names, it was the lesser stars who shined. Rudy York smacked two homers and led the Sox with five RBIs into the series as Boston took a three-game to two lead over the Cardinals, needing just one more win when the series shifted to St. Louis for game six. There, Harry the Cat Burkeen rescued the Cardinals with his second series win. And it all came down to one last chance for both teams. The Cardinals overcame an early deficit and then took a three to one lead into the eighth inning. Boston came back to tie the score and set up a legendary moment in World Series play. First, Eno Slaughter led off the eighth with a single. Then with two out, Harry the Hat Walker hit a line drive to left center. Slaughter raced all the way around from first base to score the go-ahead run and create the infamous Mad Dash. I had just been injured the inning before. Slaughter told me he had suddenly remembered that I was not in center field, and that's why he made his last dash. He actually had stopped momentarily at third base, then decided to go on in. It bothered me that I was not there when it happened. The fellow who hit the ball was a notoriously dead left field hitter, and I would have been playing way over. Slaughter said he would not have made the dash. The dash brought home the winning run as the Cardinals went on to capture the World Series, an event the Sox would not take part in for 21 more years. Just going into Fenway Park, you know, it's a cozy little place, you know, every seat is good. And the people always seem to respond. It was just a good feeling, you know, just like going into a nice warm house. Fenway Park was a wash in lights for the first time in 1947. Still, it was a season of darkness for the Red Sox, who were dumped from contention in midseason. Ted Williams, though, had another superb year and won his second triple crown. By this time, Williams had no equal. His wish to be the game's greatest hitter was coming true, and he was not yet 30 years old. In 1948, new manager Joe McCarthy got a huge hand from Ellis Kinder, who was traded from the St. Louis Browns. The Sox now had enough pitching to help them survive a wild pennant race that would come down to a one-game playoff against Cleveland. In a surprise move, Denny Galehouse, a journeyman pitcher, was given the starting assignment in the game when McCarthy bypassed his rotation. As it turned out, Cleveland clobbered Boston 8-3 behind player manager Lou Boudreaux, who starred in the pennant-winning victory. In 1949, Boston chartered another pennant course. Again, the race was frantic. In Fenway, on the next to last weekend of the season, the Red Sox swept the Yankees, all but washing away New York's pennant hopes. Then, with the season down to two games, the Sox traveled to New York with a one-game lead over their rivals and in need of one win. But the Sox never got it. In a dramatic series, they lost both games, and the pennant belonged to the Yankees, who had frustrated the Sox throughout the decade and we're now going to their fourth World Series in nine years. In 1950, the Red Sox featured another illustrious lineup, made even stronger by the league's Rookie of the Year, Walt Dropo. And once again, Fenway was filled with promise. There is just something that uh, is a part of each person who has grown up with this. You have a lot of grandfathers in here now that enjoyed it as kids, and I think that they uh, they like to remember it that way. It's just a part of their heritage. 
By 1951, Boston's population swelled to more than 800,000. The decade also brought changes to Fenway Park. The names Dorr, DiMaggio, and Pesky would vanish from the box scores. Ted Williams would again go off to war, and Sox fans would grow up with a new team. In full bloom in the early 50s, Mel Parnell was in the midst of a flourishing career. Besides two 20-win seasons, he threw a no-hitter and went on to become the winningest left-hander in team history. The 50s also brought the Sox a well-orchestrated lineup. Jimmy Pearsall came up as a shortstop, but was soon switched to the outfield, where he proved to be outstanding as well as irrepressible. To some, Pearsall's celebrated annex may have diminished his talent, but not to Casey Stengel, who declared Pearsall among the greatest outfielders he'd ever seen. Perhaps the best of all utility men, Billy Goodman, never hit below 293 with the Sox. Sammy White, meanwhile, proved ever steady behind the plate for eight years. But none received more notice than Jackie Jensen. A football star in college, Jensen was perfectly suited to Fenway Park. He knocked in 100 runs five times and had his best season in 1958 when he hit 35 homers and won the MVP. The 1950s also meant news of a local hero. Harry Aganis joined the Red Sox by way of hometown Lynn and then Boston University, where he starred in baseball and football. In his second season in 1955, Aganis looked to be in full swing. But then his career came to an abrupt end when he died of a pulmonary embolism two months after his 25th birthday. In 1957, Frank Malzone played his first full season. An instant smash, he hit 292 and collected the second most hits in the league. Considered by many the best of all Red Sox third basemen, Malzone presided over the hot corner for the next eight years. As for Pete Reynolds, his glove was an asset all around the infield, but his bat was a must. He hit over 300 five straight times and twice led the league in batting. As Boston was about to pack in the 50s, a chill came over Fenway, for a hero was about to depart. Ted Williams was 39 years old in 1957, but still won his fifth batting crown, hitting 388, the highest average in either league since his own 406. The next year, he became the oldest player ever to lead the league in batting. But in 1960, the end was a last at hand, and Sox fans came out to Fenway for one last look. The long affair between Boston and Ted Williams ended on September 28, 1960 in an otherwise meaningless game against the Baltimore Orioles. It was a cold and dreary day, and not too many more than 10,000 people showed up. I know because I was there. Understand that we were a crowd of rational people. We knew that a home run could not be produced at will. The right pitch must be perfectly met and luck must ride with the ball. Three innings before, we had seen a brave effort fail. The air was soggy. The season was exhausted. Nevertheless, there will always lurk around a corner in a pocket of our knowledge of the odds, an indefensible hope, and this was one of the times which you now and then find in sports when a density of expectation hangs in the air and plucks an event out of the future. Personally, one of my biggest broadcasting thrills. Williams did not tip his cap, and by the time the last applause drifted out of Fenway, the man who had captivated four generations of Red Sox fans slipped out of view. And so ending his career the same way it had begun 22 years earlier, Williams ascended into baseball immortality. But over the years, after being in Fenway Park, you can bet me the Boston fans, you can bet me the Boston fans were the greatest. They were the greatest fans in the world. Spring training 1961 began a new life for the Red Sox and manager Pinky Higgins, who had hoped that 21-year-old Carl Yastrzemski would succeed in replacing the departed Williams. Under great pressure, Yaz started slowly. Of course, it was only a matter of time before he would remove the awesome shadow of his predecessor. 
Meanwhile, the Sox were languishing in the second division. Bill Mambouquet did, however, lift spirits with a no-hitter in 1962. Earl Wilson matched defeat at Fenway the same season. On June 27th, he beat the Angels 2 to nothing to become the first black pitcher in American League history to throw a no-hitter. Despite singular achievements, the Red Sox suffered their worst spell in 40 years. Relief was needed, and it came in the form of the monster Dick Raddatz, who was famed as much for his unhittable fastball as for his customary victory pose. I walked into the game and I had Mickey Mantle, Roger Maris, and Elston Howard to face in the situation. And uh, being somewhere on the cocky side at that time, I told Earl Wilson, I said, why don't you just go in and open me a Budweiser and I'll be right back. I struck all three of them out on 10 pitches. And when I did it, it was the rush that came through at the time, and the, the fans, you could hear them. It was a love affair with Boston and myself, and uh, I remember when I went to Cleveland, Bernie Tebbets told me, he said, never mind that arm's over the head anymore. I said, well, you're the manager, Bernie. I said, I guess it's just a Fenway thing. And he said, yeah, we'll leave it back there. I still missed it, though. For three seasons, Raddus was the most intimidating reliever in the league. Even so, the Sox still floundered, and by the mid-60s, wondered when the tide would finally turn. Being that close to the action, to the ball players, makes it a, a real special build-up. It's like an opening uh, night at a, at a show every time a fan would walk into Fenway. Gentlemen, we're very pleased to introduce a fellow that is known to all of you, our new manager, a man we think will do a great job for the Boston Red Sox, Dick Williams. The only thing I can tell you right now, I'll guarantee you we'll have a hustling ball club, and uh, they won't quit. The other pronouncement Williams made was, we'll win more than we'll lose. But in April, even eternally optimistic fans had to wonder. Williams had taken over the same team that finished a half game out of the cellar the year before. But right from the start, the 67 Sox looked different. In the home opener against Chicago, Rico Petroselli led Boston to victory with the first of his 17 homers. Already the Red Sox season was playing as a dream. Fenway Hearts were wild with hope as their team pulled off the impossible time and time again. Here it comes. Fly ball to deep left. Yastrzemski is going hard. Way back, way back. And he dives and makes a slip in the jet. Six games out in midseason, the Sox then gave the rest of the league a jolt, winning 10 in a row late in July and pulling up to second place. By the end of August, the Sox were tangled up with the tightest pennant race ever and all through September battled with Minnesota, Detroit, and Chicago for the league. One of the most thrilling sights of all that summer was the bat of 22-year-old Tony Canigliaro. In three seasons, Tony C. had already hit 84 homers. Now in 67, his clout was even more convincing. He was one of the best clutch hitters I ever saw. In our minds, if we ever wanted someone to come to the plate and drive in a run, you would love to see Tony Canigliaro come up to the plate and be that man. Line toward left field, deep, and it is tied up. Red Sox cries died suddenly on August 18th when Tony C. brought doom to Boston. In the fourth inning of a game against the Angels at Fenway, Jack Hamilton accidentally struck Canigliaro on the cheekbone. He didn't move or react until the very last second, and by that time was too late. He got it right off the side of the face in the temple, in fact, and when he was down, I could see his face swell up, just like blowing a balloon up, and you could see the blood rushing into that area. It really wasn't a pretty sight at all, and just the location where the pitch was, it's something that if you get that close to, you really never forget it. The injury finished Canigliaro for the rest of the season, and the Sox lost a bat that had already delivered 20 homers and 67 RBIs. But despite the huge loss, the Red Sox kept on the move, thanks primarily to Carl Yastrzemski. He almost single-handedly carried the Sox through the 14 pennant race, hitting a ferocious 541 in the last 10 days of the season. All told, he would collect 44 homers, 121 RBIs and hit 326 to win the Triple Crown and the MVP. Carl Yastrzemski, Carl Yastrzemski, Carl Yastrzemski, the man they call Yaz. Yaz had the type of year that every ball player dreams of. We Fenway fans, we stop and clap our hands at Yaz's jazz. 
no matter what I hit that year, I was going to try for power. Of course, then the 67 season happened. When number eight is standing at the plate, and then he swings, whoa, there it goes again. He had what I consider in my 15 years in baseball, one of the greatest all-round years, both offensively and defensively. Ah, oh, look at Yaz, whoa, he threw him out again. I took as much pride in my defense as I did in my offense. We love him so in Boston, we all know that when he swings, yeah, here we go again. The guy hit 44 home runs that year, and I can remember 42 of those home runs meant something. They either won ball games or tied ball games or brought us back into the ball game. He never hit a single home run that year that didn't mean anything. I've never seen any one individual have that type of year that he had in 1967. Of course, Yaz wasn't the only story in Fenway that summer. 24-year-old Jim Lomberg had the season of his life, going 22 and nine to help keep the Sox rolling. But even more amazing was that one and a half game separated four teams on the last weekend of the season. When you get down to a matter of numbers, it, it automatically becomes exciting. You know, the fact that the, the grains of sand are pouring out and there's only two games left, and fate seemed to kind of be working in our favor at that time, and so it was exciting, it was Lucy. We were just having fun. The fun turned into heart-stopping drama when Lombard took the mound against Minnesota on the last day of the season. The Sox had won a must game the day before and had to win this one to at least tie for the pennant. They rallied in the sixth inning, and then in the ninth, needed one more out. Little soft pop-up. Petroselli will take it. He does. The ball game is over. The Red Sox win it. And what a mob on this field. They're coming out of the stands from all over. And what excitement we have here in Fenway Park. And so on October 1st, 1967, the dream came true. Rich Rollins got hit off the hands from Lomborg. I just couldn't wait for it to come down. It seemed like it was 100,000 feet in the air. I ran in, as did some of the other players, and, and I lifted Jim up, and we were all jumping, you know, going through the routine. And then the next thing I realized is that the field was totally filled. And then all of a sudden, I looked around, and I saw that there weren't a whole lot of faces that I recognized got a little panicky there because you couldn't see where you were going and people were all trying to pat you on the back and they literally tore Jim's shirt off his back as it worked out. Articles of clothing were starting to disappear off of my body. And so we didn't know what was going to happen to him. We said, good luck, Jim. And we all ran into, into the clubhouse. There, sitting by the radio, the Red Sox endured the agonizing wait for the outcome of the Angel Detroit game. A loss by the Tigers would mean the pennant for Boston, its first in 21 years. England, it seemed, couldn't get enough of the Red Sox. And now with the World Series at hand, no one wanted to miss out on a ticket. The series found the Sox up against the heavily favored St. Louis Cardinals. In game one at Fenway, Jose Santiago held St. Louis to two runs. But that was all Bob Gibson needed to beat the Sox. With prominent citizens on hand for game two, Boston's ace Jim Lomborg prominently displayed his Cy Young stuff. He retired the first 20 batters before Julian Javier doubled for the only Cardinal hit. Behind two homers by Yastrzemski, Lomborg went on to beat St. Louis 5 to nothing and became only the fourth pitcher in World Series history to throw a one-hitter. With the series now tied, the Red Sox went to St. Louis understandably confident. There, the Cardinals took two out of three and then went back to Boston one game from the title. But the Sox snapped out of their slump in game six and hammered St. Louis to take the series to a seventh and final game. 
Both teams sent up their aces, and each was looking for his third series win. But Bob Gibson struck out 10 to beat Jim Lomberg and bring the Cardinals the World Championship, a loss that in no way diminished the impossible dream season for the Red Sox. This was the greatest year. We were in the greatest baseball town, and we were having the greatest year that anybody could ever have. And if it didn't all work out in the end, which it ultimately didn't, we pulled up the one game short anyhow of winning it all. But yet, no one, I don't think, on that team, when we lost the seventh game of the World Series, felt like we were losers. We were winners. And we were the heroes and uh, just enjoyed it. It was a wonderful year. And as far as I'm concerned, there can never be a more exciting baseball season than 1967. I lost my edge when I was traded from here. And I think one of the main reasons was because of the fans in New England uh, playing in Fenway Park. Uh, it was, it's the best there is, as far as I'm concerned. By the late 60s, Fenway fortunes slipped once again. There are, of course, bright spots. Tony Canigliaro returned after missing all of 1968. It looked as if he were back for good. With his vision much improved, he hit 56 homers in two years. But after that, he was finished. Helping to fill the power void, Ken Harrelson hit 35 homers in 1968. The next year, Reggie Smith began a stretch in which he hit 20 or more homers six straight times. But not until 1975 did the Sox regain lost fortune and with a splendid team, find prosperity just around the corner. In Red Sox country, a wave of pennant fever settled over Fenway in early spring and then simmered all season long. The Red Sox were rebound for glory in 1975, thanks in large measure to a pair of homegrown outfielders. Fred Lynn was no ordinary rookie, and neither was Jim Rice, for no other team would ever boast such a sensational freshman pair. When you have a ball club and they're expecting a rookie to come up. They expect just one player to come up and have a good year or try to help them out to win a pennant. That year we had two, had Freddie Lynn and myself, and either two could have been Rookie of the Year, either two could have been MVP. In fact, Lynn hit 331 with 21 homers and 105 RBIs to become the first player ever to win both MVP and Rookie of the Year. Rice posted nearly identical numbers, but broke his hand in late September and was lost for the season. If the Gold Dust Twins weren't enough to hearten Daryl Johnson, pitching was. Rick Wise led the staff with 19 wins. Bill Lee won 17 for the third straight time. And Louis Tiant continued to beguile and bewilder. In the midst of seven straight winning seasons with the Sox, El Tiante won 18 games as well as the Hearts of Fenway. And all of a sudden, this fat, roly-poly little man was coming across the field with a pitching coach, and this big storm of Louie, Louie, Louie were all over the place, you know. And from then on, through that season, that was the kind of a battle cry, because they loved that man, and he was such a competitor. Whatever the fans do is great, you know, they make you feel good. Like, I think they give you a little bit more the stamina, you know, to go over there and fire him, work a little harder. A lot of us never understood what he said. I mean, <laughs> several things that through the years he has said things. And he'd always say, like I told you before. You know, like I said before, I thank you, God. No matter how much you talk, you can talk all you want. But the main thing is go over there and doing your job. You want to play the game, the people are going to love you. Sox fans love what they saw in 1975. Though Boston's lead slipped a bit in August, the Sox hung on defiantly and won the pennant. And then after sweeping Oakland in the playoffs, motored into their first World Series in eight years. Next, the Red Sox had to face Cincinnati's big red machine. Louis Tion got Boston off to a rousing start in the series opener at Fenway Park. Whirling and twirling a five hitter, Tion shut out the Reds. No one was more thrilled than a former star pitcher from Cuba who happened to be Tion's father. Rain fell through much of game two as the Sox took a two to one lead into the ninth. But Cincinnati's speed, plus the bat of Ken Griffey, conspired against Boston. And the Reds won three to two, tying up the series as it shifted to Cincinnati. 
At Riverfront Stadium for Game 3, pinch hitter Ed Armbruster laid down a bunt in the 10th inning with a man on. A play that sparked a national World Series controversy. I want you to explain exactly what you were looking at when you called the play. Darrell Johnson and the Red Sox claimed interference by Armbruster. But plate umpire Larry Barnett made no such call. The bunt proved to be decisive as the Reds scored for a 6-5 win. Louis Tiot went all the way to beat the Reds in Game 4. Cincinnati came right back in Game 5. But when the series moved back to Fenway, rainstorms caused a three-day delay for Game 6, a game Boston had to win. Dremski's at second, Fisk at first, two down, bottom of the first inning. And there's a high fly ball deep to right field. Forget it, it's gone. And so began game six as Fred Lynn put Fenway in a frenzy. But in the top of the eighth, Cincinnati continued his comeback and went ahead six to three. In the last of the eighth, with hopes barely a flicker, the Sox put two on. The Reds called on Raleigh Eastwood, and Boston countered with pinch hitter Bernie Carbo, who had delivered a pinch hit home run in game three. Vince was setting me up slider, slider, slider. With a three and two count, I just followed off a pitch that was I looked terrible on. And I thought, well, he's not going to come back with a slider again. I looked fastball, and he got it over the plate, and I hit the ball. Carbo hits a high drive, deep center, way back, home run! I was flying around those bases, and when I got to third base, I yelled at Pete Rose, and... He says, Pete, Pete, don't you wish you were this strong? And Pete Yell looks at me and he says, this is fun. This is fun. Behind Carbo's clout, the Red Sox tied the score. But an inning later, in the last of the ninth, Boston failed to score after loading the bases with nobody out. In the 11th, Joe Morgan came up with a man on and drilled a pitch that for a moment looked as if it would put the Reds ahead. But Dwight Evans miraculously dashed Cincinnati's hopes and then, for good measure, threw to first for a double play. The great drama was four hours old when Carlton Fisk led off the bottom of the 12th somewhere after midnight. The 1-0 delivery to Fisk. He swings, long drive, left field. If it stays there, it's gone. Home run! The Red Sox win! And the series is tied three games apiece. It was the best of times at Fenway, a moment instantly cast into the vast treasury of glorious Red Sox memories. The seventh game was another tense affair, and for the fifth time in the series, one run meant the difference. But the Reds ended up world champions. It was, wrote Donald Honig, as if destiny could not decide which of these two finely balanced teams should be crowned champions and waited until the last possible moment before filing a decision. Pete Rose mentioned it the best. There wasn't a loser today, because we put baseball right back on the map. I remember talking to Mr. Yaki right after the series had ended on the phone, and I said, Mr. Yaki, nobody won this series. This was a series for the people. The people won in this series because they enjoyed a great, great World Series, and you people treated us with such great respect. And I have great fondness for the people of Boston because of that. In the end, the series belonged to the Reds, but it was the sixth game that would play on and on. It's the only ballpark when I'm doing a game where with one out and a runner at first base, if there's a ground ball hit the shortstop, I can hear in my earphones the hum of anticipation that this is a double play ball. In 1976, Tom Yockey died at the age of 73. He was the last of a breed of owner who wasn't in it for money or ego, but simply for the love of the game. In his 43 years of ownership, his devotion to the team made him a champion. You looked at him as though he was your grandfather. I mean, somebody that you loved. And you grew to love him because you respected you and you respected him. Tom Yaki was a tremendous man. Uh, Mr. Yaki was like a father to me. He was the biggest fan of all. And he came in, I'll never forget it, every day in his khaki pants and his little squeegee shoes. And I'm saying to myself, this guy owns the ball club. He's just, just the most regular person that you would ever want to meet. He always came over and, and said hi to you. 
When I think of the ballpark, I think of Tom. He knew everybody in this ballpark. He had a nickname for everybody who worked here. His own nickname. But he knew everyone by name. He loved this ballpark. He never would have been happy in another ballpark. Never. I just want to say I'm certainly proud of these fellas. They've all done a terrific job, each and every one of them. From the, well, bottom to the top and in the middle and all the way through. God bless every one of them. With his passing, Yaki left behind a towering legacy at Fenway Park. With new ownership headed by Tom Yaki's widow, Jean, and Haywood Sullivan, Fenway got a sprucing up with a new scoreboard and luxury roof boxes. But the real changes came over the team itself, with the likes of Yaz, Lynn, Jerry Remy, Dwight Evans, and Butch Hobson. The 1978 Red Sox were unstoppable and held a 10-game lead in the East by mid-July. No player was more dominant than Jim Rice. Besides a league-best 46 homers and 139 RBIs, Rice would win the MVP with more total bases than any American leaguer in 41 years. In late July, however, all wasn't quite so well. Suddenly, looming dangerously large in the East were Boston's arch-rival Yankees, winning 12 out of 16 to plow through the pack. Meanwhile, the tide turned on the Red Sox. They lost 11 out of 14, and their lead was fast slipping. When the two teams met at Fenway for a critical series in early September, the Yankees trailed by four games. Fenway suddenly became a Yankee paradise as New York put the Red Sox through an excruciating four-game series, sweeping Boston by a combined score of 42 runs to seven. When the Boston massacre finally ended, the Yankees had pulled even with the Red Sox. Don Zimmer and company didn't retreat, however. They pulled themselves together and down the stretch won 11 out of 13, including seven straight to go into the last day of the season one game behind the Yankees. Rick Waits helped Boston's cause, and then Louis Tion beat Toronto to put the Red Sox in a tie with New York and force a one-game playoff to settle the season. Fenway Park was the place, October 2nd the date, and almost unbearable anticipation the mood. The latest chapter in the Red Sox-Yankee rivalry was about to begin. Ron Guidry brought a 24-3 record into the game and Cy Young stuff that appeared to be in good working order. Carl Yastrzemski did, however, get an offer he couldn't refuse and in the second inning put the Red Sox ahead one to nothing. Boston added another run and went into the top of the seventh with Mike Therese holding a 2-0 lead. With two runners on, New York's lightest hitter, Bucky Dent, came up, hitting 240 with four homers. And then Dent stunned the Red Sox. Hit high in the air to left field, going to the corner, Yaspinski. It's over the wall, it's a home run for Bucky Dent. When he first hit the ball, I thought it was an out. I just kept going back, and then I made a decision and said, this ball's going to hit the wall, and started to back away from the wall to play the count and try to hold him a single. And then when it slid over the wall, it just, we talked about loving Fenway Park so much, it's probably the one time that I hated Fenway Park on the Bucky Dent home run. The irony of Dent's home run left Sox fans dumbfounded. New York scored more and took a 5-2 lead. Goose Gossage came on in the last of the seventh and slammed the door on the Sox. But in the eighth, Boston started a kick back. Here comes Jerry Remy around second base. Hit to left field. Here comes Jaspinski around third. He will score. It is 5-4. With Fenway hopes restored, the Red Sox continue to claw their way back. Still trailing by a run in the bottom of the ninth, they got a lift. When with one out, Rick Burleson rattled the Yankees. Next batter, Jerry Remy, lined a pitch into the sun that momentarily blinded Lou Pinella. But he quickly recovered, and Burleson held up a second, a play that haunted the Sox moments later on a would-be sacrifice fly. And now, Boston's last chance fittingly 
fell on Yastrzemski. Men on first and third, two outs. All I was thinking is base it to uh, right field, use the whole ground ball. High pop up. Nettles should have it. Yankees win. I just couldn't get the head of the bat out there. Ball exploded on me. He beat me at that particular time. The Red Sox lost, so the record shows, but the 78 playoff game has become enshrined at Fenway. Bucky Dent's home run, however painful to Red Sox fans, belongs in the storied history of Fenway. For it's an important part of the great lore of the ballpark, whose massive asymmetry poses all kinds of dilemmas for those who dare to trek into its outer reaches. Fielders are also faced with such challenges as a scarcity of foul territory, a feature far more popular with the fans than with the men at work. Then too, there's the sun problem in right field. The last of the old single deck ballpark, Fenway is especially hard on visiting players who soon discover its fickle nature. This is a ballpark that is conducive to a humor, and strange things happening, no question about it. We've got a dog out there, a cat, birds of all kinds, a, a rabbit. We've had all kinds of animals. I don't know where they've come from, by the way, and there wasn't even a circus in town. No one suffers the slings and arrows of Fenway fates more than a pitcher. The ballpark may be known as friendly Fenway, but to those in the mound, it often means utter ruin. There's always something here that succeeds in withering a pitcher's spirit. Better have your wits about you. If you didn't, you're not going to be a 500 pitcher. If you don't bear down all the time and don't have your act together, Fenway Park will jump out and bite you and eat you up, spit you out. Nothing diminishes a pitcher's appetite more than the precariously close left field wall, 315 feet from home plate, 37 feet high. Indeed, as all Red Sox fans know, the wall giveth and the wall taketh away. Of course, no players have better understood the wall's complexities than the trio which has presided over it since 1939. But this isn't the only left field feature of interest. To some long-standing fans, every detail of Fenway Park has a story to be passed on. And so when these youngsters come down, I told one kid one day, I said, now look, I want you to look at that scoreboard out there and see if you see anything very different. I said, you see, there are two perpendicular lines, and they're not solid lines. One is, two aren't. I said, do you know what that is? I said, that's Mrs. Yorkie's name in Moss Code and Mr. Yorkie's name in Moss Code. While Fenway has the shortest distance to left, it has one of the league's deepest center fields at 420 feet. In 1940, the outfield got a facelift when bullpens were installed, thus creating Williamsburg and an easier home run target for Boston's young hitter, Ted Williams. The change led to still more strange angles in right. Below the foul pole, for instance, a dramatic corner can mean disaster to the uninitiated. Fenway took on a whole different look when the football Patriots played here during the 60s. Before that were the Boston Yanks and Redskins. As for college football, Boston College and Boston University took up residence here. History of another sort took place at Fenway. After World War I, more than 15,000, including 4,000 veterans, attended a military mass in memory of war dead. But Fenway Park is above all home to baseball and the Red Sox, a relationship that includes the 40-year association between the team and the Jimmy Fund, a cancer charity which derives support from all the Red Sox. It starts with all of the management people that are with the Red Sox from the front office on down to the ushers. All of the players giving their time. They have done more to further cancer research and, and caring for children with cancer than, uh, than anybody could ever uh, possibly imagine. In many ways it would be impossible to imagine life in Boston without the Red Sox. Didn't someone once say, it's universally agreed upon that there are three great things to do in New England sit in the bleachers at Fenway, vacation on Cape Cod, and uh, I forgot the third. 
It's summer again up in Boston The Red Sox are playing today And once that first ball has been tossed in Another game gets underway I always sit up in the bleachers I get such a wonderful tan I scream and I yell like a madman So the Sox know I'm their biggest fan One of the most amazing things connected with this ballpark is <laughs> the way the people get here. And the way these fans get here is just unbelievable. We draw a million eight, a million nine in a park that only holds 33,000. So you know they've got to be coming every day, every day, and they fight the traffic. They, after a game, they don't care about being blocked in. They saw the ball game. That's an amazing story in itself, the loyalty of the fans to get to this ballpark. Evidently, they go from generation to generation, and they probably tell their children and their grandchildren about, you know, they talked about Babe Ruth, they talk about Ted Williams, they talk about Joe Cronin. They not only root for the home team and give the home team due recognition when somebody performs something outstanding, they do it for the opposition, which I think is a feather in the cap of the New England fans. That in itself is great for Fenway Park. October 1st, 1983, was a bittersweet occasion for Red Sox fans. It was a day to honor Yaz, who was calling it quits. This marked the end of Yaz's Fenway days, and time to say goodbye for good. After 23 seasons, all with the Red Sox, Yaz's parting was understandably painful, for Boston's relationship with Yaz had grown into a true love affair. But in 1961, when Yaz came up to the Red Sox, he was expected to replace Ted Williams and turn superstar at once. I think being in Ted Williams' shadow put tremendous pressure on me the first few years. I would like to have come into the big leagues and been unnoticed and not taking Ted Williams' place or being called the next Ted Williams. I think it would have made it uh, much easier for me. If the burden of replacing Williams wasn't enough, Yaz felt his 5 feet 11, 175 pound frame made him unequal to the task. But in 1967, he transformed his swing and smacked 44. He was not a big man. Yaz had put every bit, every ounce into everything he did. And to see the coordination and the application that he, he made to make himself a power hitter and an RBI man and a home run hitter was really something. And I see players come in, in the training room and they got little blisters. Well, he used to, I, I'd see blood dripping off the bat. I mean, I, I'm not exaggerating. I see blood drip off the bat, and he'd still take a hundred more swings. And nobody took more extra batting, I don't think, than Carl Yastrzemski. And he loved the confrontation of one-on-one -on -one batter and pitcher more than anything else. The one-on-one -on -one competition. Everybody knows you either had a base hit, or you struck out, or you made an out. Uh, you can't hide. Every eye is set on you. Here's the pitch he has. A long time to right field. That's gone. Number 400. No doubt about it. There it goes. Number 400 for Carl Yastrzemski. There goes the ground ball. Base hit. Number 3,000. Yastrzemski's got it. And all hell breaks loose at Fenway Park. No other players ever collected 3,000 hits and 400 home runs. Yaz played in more games than any American leaguer and is the last player to win a triple crown. I wasn't the greatest power hitter that ever lived, but yet uh, I hit 400 and some home runs. I wasn't the greatest average hitter that ever lived, but yet I had 3,400 some odd hits. I drove in almost 1,900 runs. Uh, I scored almost 1,900 runs. Uh, I played pretty good defensive baseball in left field. Uh, I'm very uh, proud of my accomplishment. So at the age of 44, Yaz closed out his major league tour by making a farewell lap around Fenway. Now, bound for Cooperstown, Yaz will join the other legends of the game. You just know as a fan when you walk into that ballpark, when you watch a game that day, there's gonna be some kind of action I couldn't stand playing in these new ballparks where everything's all symmetrical. It's almost like dull after you played in Fenway Park. Stepping into the future without Yastrzemski, the Red Sox would find worthy successors. 
Third baseman and batting magician Wade Boggs came up in 1982 and has never hit below 325. Besides three batting championships in five years, Boggs had collected more than 200 hits four straight times. As for Jim Rice, he's the equal of any slugger. Besides driving in more than 100 runs eight times, he's the only player ever to collect more than 35 homers and 200 hits in three straight seasons. And so, with a wealth of talent, Boston took on a new look in 1986. If April had been a cruel month in recent seasons, it now was filled with promise, brought to life by the home team. And with the Red Sox winning early and often, Boston was about to start jumping. In mid-May, the Red Sox took over first place for good, and pennant fever was bubbling over at Fenway. Don Baylor stoked the flames with 31 homers and 94 RBIs, plus a large measure of leadership. Of course, no one guided the Red Sox better than pitching ace and chief firebrand Roger Clemens, who would win the MVP and Cy Young Award. But he was never better than on April 29th, when he fanned 19 Seattle batters and stood one strike away from the record book. Here's the pitch. Strike three! Roger Clemens has broken the Major League record. Four strikeouts in one game. He has struck out 20. And Roger Clemens of the Boston Red Sox is the first man in the history of Major League Baseball to strike out 20 men in a nine-inning baseball game. And all of his teammates now are gathered right at the mound. High-fiving Clemens. Roger, I think, is looking for Debbie, his wife. They are embracing in one of the most dramatic moments this great little ballpark in Boston has ever seen. From that point, the Red Sox won 10 of their next 12 games and kept streaking. As for Clemens, he would go 24-4 and four to dig Red Sox pitching out of mediocrity and into the best staff in the East. If pitching had been the demon of the Red Sox, it now was an angel of mercy and helped carry them to a division title. A high pop-up. This may do it. Buckner is there. It's all over. The Red Sox are the new division champions. With the shadows of doubt at last lifted, the Red Sox stood on top of the East and now with their first division title in 11 years, headed into the playoffs. With a full house at Fenway for game one of the playoffs, the Sox figured to bring the California Angels down to earth. But Roger Clemens surrendered four runs in the second inning, and California breezed to an eight to one win as Mike Witt went all the way on a five hitter. But picture perfect offense, plus glaring sun in right field, turned game two into a wild affair in which the Sox won 9-2 and headed west all even. Then the Angels won the next two. The second on a Bobby Gritch 11th inning hit to put the Angels one win from the pennant. The Angels figured to wrap it up in game five when Gritch again turned hero with help from Dave Henderson. And going into the ninth, California led by three runs. But Baylor gave the Angels a jolt when with one out on the top of the ninth, he smacked a two-run homer to pull the Red Sox within one. Then with one on and two outs, Donnie Moore was summoned to face Boston's last chance, Dave Henderson. The Sox looked doomed. But then he sent shockwaves through Anaheim Stadium with a crushing blow that lifted the Red Sox out of their grave. Two innings later, Henderson hit a sacrifice fly to win the game and cap off one of the greatest comebacks in Red Sox history. Alive and well back in New England for game six, the Sox launched an explosion in the third inning when they scored five runs. And behind oil can Boyd, 
Boston thrashed the Angels. En route to playoff MVP, Marty Barrett delivered three hits in the game. He would wind up with 11 in all to tie a playoff record. The Sox, meanwhile, wound up with a 10-4 win, bringing the series to one last game. In Game 7, Boston's tower of power, Jim Rice, snapped out of a series slump to knock the daylights out of Angel pitching in the fourth inning. With a three-run homer, Rice gave Roger Clemens more than enough clout and helped the Sox to an ample lead they held all the way. The crowd at Fenway Park now ready to explode. This incredible ball club. Picked by so many to finish at or near the bottom. Swing and a miss. Strike three. Chiraldi leaping on the mound in his teammates out there pounding into pieces as the Boston Red Sox have defeated the California Angels and will represent the American League in the World Series. Time to shuttle to New York for the World Series opener at Shea Stadium and face the heavily favored Mets who had won 108 games in the regular season. But the Red Sox were undaunted as John McNamara got a brilliant performance from starter Bruce Hurst, who held the Mets to four hits. Wade Boggs, meanwhile, kept a hold on New York in the field. In the top of the seventh, with the game locked in a pitcher's duel, Rich Gedman snapped a scoreless tie with help from Tim Tuffle. The error led to the only run of the game. Then in the bottom of the ninth, Calvin Chiraldi came on to hold his former team in check and put the finishing touches on the shutout. Chiraldi saved the one nothing victory as the Red Sox took the opener. In game two, a dream matchup between Roger Clemens and Dwight Gooden turned out to be a bust as the Red Sox smashed New York pitching with 18 hits and nine runs. And with a nine to three win, the Red Sox left Shea Stadium up two games to none. But the tune changed radically in game three when the series shifted to Fenway. The Sox were all set for a bash, but right off the bat, Oil Can Boyd got rocked by Lenny Dykstra. Dykstra's leadoff home run brought the Mets out of their doldrums. Moments later, a ground ball to third turned into a fiasco for the Red Sox, who didn't know if they were coming or going. Red Sox woes continued as the Mets won that game and the next, tying up the series. In game five, Dave Henderson sparked Boston's suddenly flat offense in the second inning. With the game scoreless, Henderson delivered one of 12 Red Sox hits in all. Fenway was rocking moments later when Spike Owen brought Henderson home with the first run of the game. The Sox had only just begun. They scored one more next inning and then spruced up their lead with two more in the fifth. If the Red Sox offense wasn't enough to hobble the Mets, Bruce Hurst was. Going all the way, Hurst shut down the Mets for his second series win, and the Red Sox were only one win away. Game six at Shea Stadium. With the Mets on the brink of extinction, it looked as if the Red Sox were closing in on a great upset. In the first inning, Dwight Evans immediately tipped the scales Boston's way when he put the Sox ahead one to nothing. They scored another run next inning, and there things stood until the Mets tied it in the fifth. In the seventh, Boston untied it to go ahead three to two. But the Red Sox lost starter Roger Clemens to a blister, and Calvin Chiraldi came on in the last of the eighth. One out later, the Mets tied it three to three. Things stayed that way until the 10th, when Dave Henderson stunned the huge Shea Stadium crowd with a leadoff home run. The Red Sox added another run and led 5-3 with three outs to go. In 
In the bottom of the tenth, the Mets were just about to expire. Chiraldi was now in his third inning and still sharp. Wally Backman led off the inning with a first out. Next batter, Keith Hernandez, made it two down, and the Red Sox were one out away. But in a shocking turn of events that stilled Boston hearts, the Red Sox fell apart. Chiraldi gave up three straight hits as the Mets pulled within one. Bob Stanley was called on to restore order, but with two strikes on Mookie Wilson, Stanley's pitch got away, and the Mets tied the score. Moments later, just one pitch from ending the inning, outrageous fortune struck the Red Sox again. So ended a miraculous comeback by the Mets, who won 6-5 to five in a game for the ages. The Mets would, of course, go on to win the finale and become 1986 world champions, capping off a spectacular season. But the frozen images of the sixth game would linger over the Red Sox like a haunting refrain. Still, 1986 was a wonderful season for Boston. And in the great reservoir of Red Sox memory, it would be remembered as the year the Red Sox fooled them all and won the pennant just as they did back in 67. For at Fenway, the Red Sox will always be champions, no matter what the record shows. Take me out to old Fenway. Take me back through the years. I'm very happy to go to Boston, and will do my utmost to warrant Mr. Yorkie's confidence in me. Yes, hitting that home run in the All-Star game in the ninth inning was certainly a big thrill, and I'll never forget the rest of my life. Give me one more glimpse of Jim Lornborg and Tian spinning around. Jim, can I say on behalf of about a million fans out there, thanks for a sensational year. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. It's a team which lost uh, one of the top five hitters in American League in the Canigle Arrow for six weeks. The team didn't quit. Uh, I know the kind of spirit that this ball club has. It's a crucial game for us and uh, maybe a crucial game for baseball itself. I think we showed a lot of people how the game's supposed to be played. Take me back to my childhood. Let the game be just fun. Game six of that series in 75. The impossible dream team, please keep that alive. Let me root, root, root for the Red Sox. Yeah.